Right. This is Stacy Krim, and today is September 22nd, 2020. Would you please state your name and the pronouns you would like to use for this interview? I am Marnie Thompson, and I use she pronouns. All right. So where are you from originally? I was born uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. Excellent. What brought you to North Carolina? Uh, I came first to North Carolina when I was 17 to attend uh, college at Duke in Durham. Um, and that didn't go the way I or my parents had planned it. Um, and I ended up dropping out with four Fs within six, eight weeks. And I went back to Cleveland with my tail between my legs, um, turned 18 and quickly moved back to North Carolina because it was the place I'd lived that wasn't my parents' place. <laughs> I love my parents, but it was time to get out. So I've lived here since I was 17 or 18, depending on when you start counting. Um, and eventually I did graduate from Duke nine years later. And by the time I did, I had a six-year-old in tow and I wasn't exactly a traditional student at that time. So. What brought you to Greensboro? Um, I had been living in Durham for 10 years and uh, I started, two things collided together. I started going, attending classes in the MFA, Master of Fine Arts program in the uh, painting and sculpture department at UNCG, just a couple days a week driving over for classes. And the guy I was living with at the time ended up, he was a Montessori school teacher and he ended up getting a job at the Montessori school over here. So we picked up and moved over here uh, in 1983. What motivated you to begin working in social justice advocacy? Um, a lot of people have asked me that. And I think I mostly zero in on I was born in 1955, so the 60s was coming over the television into my life. And I was deeply engaged with and frightened by and excited by the civil rights struggles that I was seeing play out. And I have a very vivid memory of being about seven or eight years old, watching the nightly news with my father and seeing images of Bull Connor's uh, dogs biting and chewing on people who weren't that much older than me, kids in Birmingham, Alabama, um, and the fire hoses on those kids and all that. And I remember asking my father, what is that? And him saying, point blank, that's racism. It's a very bad thing. There were, there's a lot to unpack there because, because my father and I would be having that conversation in our lovely home on the edge of a golf course that belonged to the country club, which was a whites only country club that we were members of. And so noticing the dissonance, like, like, yes, I see why that's bad. I wanna be on the fight side with the kids that are fighting against the dogs. And then sort of coming into consciousness that there's a lot of contradictions in my own life. At the same, in the same decade, the women's movement is reviving again in a really important a way that meant a lot to me. Um, by the time I was in eighth grade, I was very engaged in women's liberation, thinking, reading, and activism, if I could figure out how to get to it. And I mean, remember, no internet, nothing like the, you know, the access now. Um, and I, I don't even know how you lived through that period and were paying a moderate amount of attention and you didn't get captured one way or another into wanting to be on the right side in these tremendously important struggles. I wouldn't have known at the time to think, oh, I want to be a social, social justice person. I wouldn't have used those words exactly, but that started, started me off through high school. I was getting engaged in lots of different kinds of activism. Um, it, and so when I moved south and I had this very different life experience than the one that was plotted out for me, being the child of wealthy people, going to a private girls school that was almost all white, and I started living in the South where the fundamental race relation dynamic is between black people and white people. And there, and the, it's, and I didn't have a wealth advantage to like separate me or wealth, anything to, I don't even know if it's an advantage, but I mean, I just live in a working class life. We're going to work and working side by side with people who thought lots of different things and were lots of different kinds of people. Um, I just, it became even more important to me. I know that, some people 
say that when you have your children, you get conservative, you, you stop seeking big change out of a sense of protectiveness for your kids. But I was a young mom. And the moment my daughter was born, I think I became even more radicalized at that point, wanting to have a world that was right for her, uh, a place that would be safe for her, as well as a place she could thrive in. So that further propelled me down the path. Um, in Durham, I sort of fell in with a crowd of people who are a few years older than me, mostly college graduates uh, and older, who were deeply involved in the People's Alliance and doing local organizing for racial justice and economic justice. And that's where I started to learn how to be a community organizer and an activist, just as a volunteer hanging around with those guys. And when I got to Greensboro, I kept doing it. I, as soon as I moved to Greensboro in 83, I started searching for a community of people that would support me in that kind of wanting to make a difference locally, but also having, I mean, this was also the era of um, think globally, act locally was a phrase that people were starting to use a lot. And so we had, I got involved here right away with getting the U.S. out of Central America. The U.S. was busy pounding on El, El Salvadorian uh, workers and trying to undermine the Nicaraguan re revolution. And I was involved with lo a local group of people. Then we went door to door and knocked on doors and said to people, hey, what do you think about U.S. policy in Central America? And they would look at us like, what are you talking about? We have a, we're Central America. And, but we would engage them. Well, let me tell you what we're doing in Central America. And by the time we were done, they would have an opinion about U.S. engagement in Central America, thanks to us. And we knocked on over a thousand doors all over Greensboro and were able to tell Howard Coble when he would stand up in public in support of the Reagan administration's policies of bombing and harassment in Nicaragua and El Salvador. No, 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 your constituents don't think that. Look at our data and our data showed overwhelming support for getting the U.S. out of Central America. Um, so over the years in Greensboro, I did sort of peace work, I, I would say peace and justice oriented work, uh, anti-racist work, gay rights work, which they don't even call it gay rights anymore. I feel so old when I say that, you know. Um, lots of uh, work about violence against women, um, mostly as an unpaid volunteer, economic justice, housing justice, sort of, there's a crowd in Greensboro that I fell in with that just, you want any of that? You could get to all of it through any of those folks, so. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time on your early activism career in Greensboro, and I know that was a long time ago. Yeah, I can so, <laughs> so I'm going to throw out a few organizations you worked with, and uh, let's see if you can remember anything about them. This is not a test. Okay. <laughs> So the Guilford Alliance for Gay and Lesbian Equality, Gaggle, do you remember working with them? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I would say that the main people I worked with were Maura Fallon and John D'Amelio on that. Um, and, 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 and a much larger crowd than that. Um, and I, you have to remember that the AIDS crisis was brewing into the, in the 80s. And so by the time... Gaggle. Uh, we thought that name was great because its acronym was Gaggle. It's like what you call a group of gay people, a gaggle. Get it? Anyway, um, nobody else seemed to appreciate that joke the way I did. Um, yeah, so I mean the oppression of gay people was massive anyway and then the AIDS crisis comes along and people get really frightened. There's tons of misinformation and there's also tons people don't know yet about how that virus works and its association with a despised form of sexual behavior um, didn't help. Uh, so it, it was important to organize gay people and it wasn't, it was probably, I, I won't lay the claim that it was the first organized group of gay people in Guilford County but it was the first really above board group. And that doesn't mean that everybody who participated was out. To be out in the 80s had huge consequences. I mean, I would guess that for, at, at, a, at any different time, I mean, we different ways you might count membership in Gaggle. We might have once, you know, people gave us money, people came to a meeting, all those, mem those ways you might gauge it. We probably had about 200 to 300 members in one form or another. And most of them were gay or lesbian, 
or bi or whatever. They would, the word queer was just not in use in that much at all at that era. Um, most of them had to be deeply in the closet because they would have lost their jobs. It's that simple. They would not have been able to keep their jobs if they had children. Their children would have been taken from them. And so having a group that had a few people that were able to be like the front, the outwardly facing people talking openly about what it was like to be gay or lesbian was hugely important, but still being able to protect the, the, the closeted lives of many other people. And it was at that edge that that starts to crack open about whether you can come out. What does it mean to come out? Who has, who can take the risk of coming out? And also this notion that you come out once and it's over. Hell no, you're constantly, people are assuming you go to a grocery store and people assume you're straight till you tell them otherwise, does it matter? And you have to pick, you know, what are the ways that you're going to come out? And my personal engagement with, with it was uh, because I had lots of gay and lesbian friends and I was in, in the late 80s, a very deep, dramatic, romantic and sexual relationship with a couple different women and at different times. And I was starting to feel that oppression directly as well. Um, but because at that time I was making my living through self-employment activities, I wasn't at risk of losing my job. Um, I did risk losing custody of my daughter to some extent, but my daughter's father lived far away. There was no internet and the chance that he was gonna ever find out what we were up to was pretty limited. Um, but it, that's the irony. I mean, I did that every day knowing that if he found out, he could go to court and make a case that I was an unfit mother, even though he had disappeared from her life and hadn't paid child support and all the other measures of whether he was a connected father or not, but he would have had good standing and possibly could have prevailed in a court of law all through the 80s into the early 90s under those circumstances. So that's what I got to say about the Guilford Alliance for Gay and Lesbian Equality. Oh, and I can say this, the stuff that, that the LGBTQ movement is fighting for now is a little different. I mean, we were focused on getting fair treatment for people with HIV, for sure. Um, we were trying to get change local law, rules and laws so that people wouldn't be fired for their sexual orientation. That was huge. We weren't really into marriage equality and there was a big fight going on all the time amongst us about whether that was something to shoot for or whether that was patriarchal. Uh, and backwards. Um, we were fighting for the right for partners to be with each other in key moments in life, like in, at, the, at a hospital bedside. So those were the sorts of things that we were fighting for. So you were fighting at the time Greensboro was trying to pass a non-discrimination ordinance. Yeah, yeah, and we were the originators of that fight, and we, and we won that fight. Uh, we won that fight in 89, I think. I may get my years wrong here. And then the new council was elected that fall within months of us winning that fight. And the new council turned around and quietly undid it in December of 79. If I, if I'm, I, make it, I have my dates wrong. And then later, and we won it in a very public council vote. It, it's not, it wasn't citywide. It was Greensboro city policy that they wouldn't fire an employee or a contractor couldn't fire, fire an employee. And um, it got undone. And then uh, within a year or two, other more uh, politic or no, no, more um, backroom, backroom negotiating kind of people uh, ended up negotiating that exact arrangement as a policy, but not a law in, Gil in Greensboro. And it's been the it's been the the regs for the city of Greensboro since sometime in the early '90s. Mm -hmm. And Gaggle did something else um, that was great. They systematically documented incidences of. Oh yeah, I forgot that we did that. Yes, yes, we did. <laughs> oh, yeah, and violence. I mean, discrimination like job loss uh, or not being considered for a job, not being promoted on a job. Uh, people just being mean to you in public if you showed who you really were. But I think, I think the, the threat of violence was constant. I mean, just to walk down the street holding my girlfriend's hand was a terrifying thing to do during that era. And it's so, I'm not saying that isn't still a terrifying thing to do in some communities, and it still is in this town sometimes, and, but it's also completely normalized now to see two women or two men holding hands 
a lot of people still don't like it, but they know they do not have the, the force of law behind them if they feel like spitting on them or attacking them. And things have changed. I never, I frankly never thought that the, we would be this far in, because the hatred of gayness was so fucking huge. I just, I couldn't imagine that it could be undone, but it has been undone in large measure. It's not over with. And it's always there to be revived in, you know, when it's useful to some other scheme to build and take power. We're seeing that happening all the time now. But yeah, we did, we, we documented the violence so that we couldn't, the city couldn't pretend. We were bringing that information to um, the city's uh, Human Relations Commission and the police department and the elected officials. Um, and that was interesting, actually, because we thought, oh, the lo obvious place for us to be working at the local level was with the Human Relations Commission. And we had a really mixed reception there because those bodies, I now know this, I, this is me as a white person under, learning about how racism works. Duh, those bodies were established in the 70s, sometimes with the best sorts of purposes in mind, sometimes just, oh, let's let the black folks blow off steam over here in this powerless human relations commission and everything in between. And so here come a bunch of queer people demanding that the human relations commission attend to their uh, needs. And those bodies are like, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? You choose your oppression. You don't have to be gay. We have to be black. I mean, it was, there were some really interesting conversations and eye-opening learning for me about the history of racial oppression. And I still believe that the Human Relations Commission should be dealing with all forms of oppression. Um, but I certainly didn't show up with enough sensitivity to the, the, the sensibilities of the people who were sitting on the Human Relations Commission and the staff of the Human Relations Commission at the time. All right. Um, so let's, you have just a long list of organizations you worked with. Let's touch on the Greensboro Citywide Poor People's Organization. Do you remember that one? Oh, sure. That revolved largely around the beloved Community Center and Faith Community Church. Um, and I'm, I'm in a very deeply, a long and deeply respectful relationship with uh, Nelson and Joyce Johnson and all the activities centering around that world. And in, nine, I can't remember the years, early 90s, 92, 93, 94, somewhere in there, the Greensboro Citywide Poor People's Organization, it doesn't come into being for the first time. In fact, that Poor People's Organization has kind of been around off and on in groups that, that Joyce and Nelson and others were connected to, mostly in East Greensboro. But in around 92 or 93, Nelson and I were seeing a fair amount of each other doing organizing on a number of things. And he said to me one day, can you do something with these white people that are trying to be helpful? And so basically we created the Friends of the Poor People's Organization, the FPPO, sometimes called the White People's Auxiliary, um, and which was a place where, uh, and, and it's, it's, I mean, it's so interesting to interrogate the equation of poorness with racial identity. This is something I've spent the whole, my whole adult life trying to tease out and help people, help myself understand and help other people understand. No, no, being black doesn't equal being poor, being poor doesn't equal being black, but because of the mechanisms of oppression, that is often the way it goes. And I think it's, we have an over obsession with the race component of it and don't pay enough attention to the extractive nature of an economy that's structured like ours that condemns large numbers of people in, in, into poor people status. And they happen to use racism as a tool to facilitate that extraction uh, and to let people feel it's acceptable to extract from certain groups of poor people. Um, so anyway, yes, I did that work, uh, main people, well, so I was working a lot with Nelson. Uh, that's, I'd been working with Ed Whitfield and Irvin Brisbane. And so I'm trying to think of some of the black folks that were active with the Poor People's Organization. Um, uh, Linda, uh, Linda Jones, Melina Cannon. Um, so those are some of the names that come to mind uh, for that. 
And then I started hanging out deliberately constructing meeting spaces and activities with other white people who wanted to be of use. We raised money, not a lot. Um, this was not a movement that needed a lot of money, frankly. It needed, needed other forms of support for the most part. Um, and then we stood up in press concert conferences to illustrate, yes, this is what, what white people who are fighting racism might do. They might stand alongside black folks who are fighting racism and just say, yeah, but we're not gonna tolerate that either. Um, so yeah, that, we did that work for years. Um, and I, I, it was a recruiting ground for getting people to get arrested in the Kmart struggle, uh, which I remember getting arrested twice in early 1996 by and people were getting arrested for um for trespassing on the property of kmart um where we would have almost every sunday there would be a major demonstration in a parking lot at the kmart one or the other kmart and um as a way to sort of tell kmart you've got to negotiate with the union that the workers of kmart have voted you and you've got to negotiate with them because i mean we had we had, we had been connected and supported uh, the fight for for that union to be established, the union vote happened and it was successful. And then Kmart basically tried to shut it down by failure to to negotiate, which is a pretty common union busting activity. Um, that's a great example of something that was really heavily dominated by black leadership, and and they and, and there was widespread obvious racism in the way Kmart management was behaving towards its employees and its workers and and. So it mattered to bring the racial lens to that, racist lens, I should say, but it really was about economic justice. These are working people who can't, who have unsafe and not fairly paid working conditions. And that's why that union came into being. You um, were also involved with seeking justice and bringing attention to race-based law enforcement violence in Greensboro, yeah. including the cases of Daryl Howerton yeah, yeah. and Bob Cannon. Right, right. Oh. oh, yes. Well, I mean, in the time of George Floyd, isn't it? I mean, Daryl Howerton, oh my goodness. I became friends with his mom, Brenda, and I didn't meet her till, I didn't know Daryl had been killed until years after it happened. He was um, shot and killed by police on the corner of, in a barbershop, or in a parking lot outside a barbershop near the corner of Phillips Avenue and Summit Avenue. And it's interesting to me because I drove past that point all the time in more recent years in my connection with the Renaissance Community Co-op grocery store which was on Phillips Avenue. And every time I drove by the TV barbershop, I just would like flash on what must have happened there that day. So he was a, he was a young man with obvious mental problems. Somebody in the barbershop, I think the owner of the barbershop called the police to say there's a naked man in the back of my shop and he's got, it seems to have a knife and he's feeding meat to some dogs. And I'm really worried. He's like using the knife, to, a steak knife to cut the meat up, raw meat, I think. And and he said, this doesn't make sense. He's obviously not okay. Can you please help him? In no way was the call, I feel endangered by this young man. And police were there, got there and within minutes he was gunned down with multiple bullet wounds. Um, it was just your classic ugh, case, which we see again and again and again. So years, several years later, Brenda sued uh, the, I mean, the city, the police officers in, officers in question. I don't remember all the details of the suit. And I, I became part of the support team to go to court with her, to talk to the press with her, and to witness, oh gosh, being in those court, the courtroom when the actual case was finally heard. And the explanation, well, these, these officers were simply following their training. And that has that is what has held so much of the failure to, to deal with the epidemic of police brutality that has been running in the United States since Jim Crow. Um, I mean, I, I was just up close and personal with it 
for that whole time. It was, it was heartbreaking. Brenda, by the way, went on to become a county commissioner in Durham County, and she's a very powerful politician over there right now. That's kind of interesting. She kind of cut her teeth on public, having public presence in some ways, fighting for what happened to her son to be recognized for what it was. Wow. Um, yeah, and then Kwame, again, that's mostly through my affiliation with the Beloved Community Center, which mobilized just tons of people to get Kwame out of prison on a very unjust, two consecutive life sentences in, uh, thing. He was a teenager who got caught burglarizing homes. Uh, even, and actually what was a really important thing about that case is that one of the women, to, to burglarize a home means that a person is home in the house. And watching his interactions with, I'm, I'm trying to remember the woman's name, it'll come to me maybe, um, who had been burglarized and realized when she reported that burglary, it was sort of the thing that led to his capture. And she went on to travel the state saying, this man should be freed. He was a teenager. He should not be punished for the rest of his life. Yes, I was terrified the night I woke up and realized there was a burglar in my house. And he has apologized to me. And, and to watch the two of them to get Myra, Myra, oh gosh, to watch Myra and Kwame together and the friendship that they developed while he was in prison and then continued once he was finally let out of, of prison. Um, anyway, yeah, that was a huge fight. I remember having a bed sheet hanging from my, I mean, just the patheticness of some of my attempts to show solidarity. I had this big bed sheet, queen size bed sheet painted free Kwame Cannon and it was hanging off my front porch. And I got somebody in the neighborhood didn't like it. So they called the city sign people, you know? And so somebody showed up on my porch saying, you're gonna get fined, I don't know, hundred dollars a day that you don't take that thing down. I left it up for a couple of days and paid the fine. And then and it looked awful too. It just looked awful. <laughs> but it wasn't just me having a sign. It was like meetings, raising at consciousness and all that kind of stuff. Um, so you were also involved in school redistricting, um, especially with the ACOC school redistricting oh in God. Guilford County. <laughs> yes. Just looked a kick of the night. <laughs> yes, we were. Oh man, did I piss off some white people there. Um, yeah, and I would say that, so the North Carolina Racial Justice Network, which doesn't exist anymore. I mean, there may be a group with that name at this point, but it's not the same group. And that was founded by Irvin Brisbane. Um, and he was working very closely with the local AFSC, American Friends Service Committee chapter, and Terry Austin. Um, anyway, we sort of, we were white folks who were very consciously working side by side with the North Carolina Racial Justice Network, which was also multiracial, but heavily led by black folks about the school redistricting fight. And the basic theory, if I'm remembering this correctly, it was like every school should be a good school. This fight to make sure your kid gets districted into the good schools. And so much of what was understood to be a good school was a white school. Um, I mean, it was just like, it just laid bare how racism and classism worked in Guilford County. And so our job in many ways was to go to, I mean, the way they did this redistricting process, they must have held 50 to 60, maybe more of these neighborhood level meetings to get feedback from everybody about it or to tell them about it and hear their reactions. And I mean, there'd be a meeting and the next thing you knew, the line would be tweaked. So this one family would be in a different, you know, and these are deeply emotional issues, especially if, you know, you went to some school and you moved into that place so you could, your kid could go to that school and now that's not true anymore. There's lots of not racist, not classist reasons to care about where your kids go to school, but boy, did we see plenty of assumptions that were class and race driven. And so it was our job to sort of get into that fight. And I remember calling out some, uh, many, some, I don't know, some very particular people and some just generalities we would be making about white folks fighting to be in certain school districts in my own. So I am currently districted, my house is districted into Lindley Elementary, Kaiser Middle and Grimsley High School. When my daughter was in school, we didn't live in this house and she went to school originally 
oh, a string of schools as we moved a lot in the, her early years. We, she was at Sternberger and then Washington, and then she went to the, a magnet school out on Bessemer Avenue. I don't even remember the name of that school now. It was the open school. But then in middle school, she went to Jackson, and for high school, she went to Smith. And these are, these are by the time of that era, these were known as not good schools because the student populations were not majority white and lots of working class kids went to them. And I, and I got, I was just made ill by being in my own neighborhood association meetings with people talking about how imperative it was that we get districted out of Smith and Jackson and into Kaiser and Grimsley. And some of Lindley Park was already at Kaiser and Grimsley and they were making the case that, um, that it should, the whole of Lindley Park should go be going to, for a, a fair argument in many ways, but the arguments that were being made were really freighted with racist assumptions about my kids can't learn with slow learners in the room and slow learners there would be code for black kids. Um, and, and it also was like, oh, you're pissing on my daughter's education. My daughter who's now in college and doing fine. And you're saying she got a shitty education and I think she's doing fine. And so it got heated in my neighborhood association from time to time because I was making sure it got heated. I, you know, and it wasn't so much that I needed my home to be dis continue to be districted into the Smith and Jackson schools. I didn't like the way that was being handled. And I remember we were, we were all up in a fight around where Fisher Park was going to get districted. And I don't even remember where they might have been districted. And I to this day can't remember where they did get districted in the end. But I remember we were challenging a lot of racist and classist statements that were being made about where why this group of white kids should go to some other school. I, I, I just, but I don't, the details, they are now lost on me. At the time I knew everything about it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so uh, of course you did a lot of work with women's issues. So you were involved with the Community Coalition Against Violence to Women, the North Carolina Women's Political Caucus and the Pro-Choice Voter Identification Project. Oh, wow, I forgot about that. <laughs> and, and the Women's Committee on Central America. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> so I, I do remember um, you did a lot of work about empowering women politically, um, yeah. to be yeah. political, politically savvy. There was a lot of public education going into that. Right, right. I um, actually made my living, a very bad living, but I made a living being a political consultant to women candidates for a while. Um, I was, so I have a bachelor's degree in computer science with a secondary concentration in math. And I've really only made use of that in my later life by, like I was an early adopter of a home computer. I had a computer before a lot of people did. Keeping in mind, by the way, when I was getting my computer science degree, it was only in my last year that I sat in front of a monitor with a keyboard. Before that, I used punch cards. So it's a very different era. Um, yeah, so I used my computer skills as well as my community organizing skills to bring data to serve uh, with getting cool people elected. And most of my people that I consulted for, some people I consulted for free, some I charged money to, um, was on what, I, what you'd call um, voter targeting, where you're figuring out, oh, in this set of precincts that this seat represents, this is, what the, this is who the voters are in general, who they are, and which ones are likely to vote for you, and help you to focus the mailings or the phone banking or the whatever. The tools for this are now vastly more efficient and, and better and smarter. And at the time, just being able to call up the Guilford County Board of Elections and say, hey, can I come over with my floppy disk and get some data from you guys and then go home and run it through my Lotus 123 spreadsheet program. That was gave me information and information was a bit of power. And I, I we were six. And so I worked privately doing that. Or, but but I was often in league with a lot of women who uh, were interested in reproductive rights. And certainly that was a key issue in us figuring out which candidates we were gonna support. And the National Political Women's Political Caucus, that was like their issue in many ways. It wasn't their only issue, but that was what, that's what allowed uh, NWPC to endorse both Democrats and Republicans because they would uh, 
they, if they could find a pro-choice Republican woman, they were going to back her. And I, I think, maybe if she was horrible on other things, maybe they wouldn't, but that would allow them to certainly think about that. Um, so I was getting some training and building relationships at the national women's political caucus level, but mostly not. Mostly it was in the state level and the local level of uh, NWPC. And I met um, a lot of good women doing that. I have to say my general feelings about doing years of electoral focused work is that I stopped after a while. I would see, I would help women get elected and not just women, women and men, and they would get in place and they'd be like the only good, good soul in the body and they couldn't turn the ship because it was just them and we didn't amass enough power behind them or just as often, they would become just part of the machine. They're, you know, they might speak the speak. They weren't consciously going over to the other side. They just became unable to really work towards a vision of radical transformation anymore. You just get so caught up in the... So I began to get sort of sour on elected electoral politics. Um, so stopped doing a lot of that after a while. I want to say that this year, I am phone banking every Friday night uh, for Guilford for All. And our job is to convince folks to pay attention to the county commissioner races and the school board races in particular. I care intensely uh, about that. It's it, uh, the, mach the machinery that has been established and the leadership that's being shown by the current crowd of young, mostly black leaders uh, that are leading Guilford for all. I couldn't be happier for them. And I am happy to have them tell me what to do and who I need to talk to on the phone. And talk, chat with voters about the county commissioner races. So I'm back at it. <laughs> so all of this experience with a wide variety of advocacy areas and then your disenchantment with higher level po politics, um, did that come into play in your decision and thoughts to found the Fund for Democratic Communities? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, over time it became clear that for all of the United States cultural talk about democracy, that we Americans know precious little about the practice of democracy. Um, you know, for like, like it's so cool, so innovative that we have a representative democracy where every two years we go vote for the national and every now every four years it's on the local and we elect our representatives and they must do our bidding or they get unelected the next time around. I'm like, oh, that is so weak now. And, and we see how subject to corruption that is. So Ed and I had been doing a lot, Ed Whitfield and I had been doing a ton of work on many of these projects together and getting closer to, in our thinking and just enjoying working together. And we had begun talking in the, by the late 90s, early 2000s, a lot about people don't understand democracy. And I remember thinking, I don't understand democracy. Where was I supposed to learn how to have a democratic dialogue? I didn't learn this anywhere. I mean, I had been trying to set up and facilitate community activist gatherings where we would behave in a democratic fashion. And it broke down a lot. And I also saw a ton of base building work, which is an essential component of building power so that, you know, regular people can be, have the power together to build their society for the way they want it. I saw a ton of base building work that was built around charismatic leadership as opposed to building the capacity of individuals and people working in community to build collective capacity and to, to make decisions together and to then get to work doing the thing that they decided to do. And charismatic leadership is a it's, it's a way to start to build a core of people. Uh, yes, I like what that leader is saying. He's making sense to me. It's usually a he. Um, and, and then there's no real power dispersal that can happen because it's all about that person's intelligence and what they're saying right now. And it has real limits. And we need, an, we need to build power in a much more broad-based kind of way. So this failure, understanding how weak the culture's general understanding on democratic practice was, was why we decided to focus on building authentic grassroots democracy. And we had very little to do with electoral politics across the entire life of F40C. I remember waking up 
the, uh, the day after Donald Trump was elected president. And I was, oh man, I felt awful. I felt like I had been, as a woman, I felt so violated that this predator, this known predator had been elected and then a, that maybe not a pure majority of voters, but a majority of electoral votes had gone his way and that it was okay to behave like that. I mean, there were so many things that made me feel horrible. And I remember crying when I woke up and talking to my husband about it and talk, crying on the phone with my daughter before I went to work. And then I went to work and every single person at F40C came into work that day on time. Everybody was pissed and upset. And we get, went to work and guess what we did? We did exactly what we were gonna do anyway because we believed that what we were doing, building authentic democracy at the most grassroots levels was where the action needed to be. If we had done more of that, if more people had done it with us, if we had been better at it, maybe Trump wouldn't have been elected. And maybe we'd have a world that was more democratic, more just and more fair in every single way. So the, the organization has this very strong focus on what you call authentic democracy. Can you uh, talk a bit about how the organization defines authentic democracy? Oh, I wish I haven't actually looked at our stuff about that in a while, but I would say this. Um, democratic dialogue, which we're basically creating space for people to come together and talk about what do they want for their world to look like and reach agreement about that and then start to reach agreements in dialogue together about what are the best ways to move forward to get there. So the democratic dialogue is a really critical part. Democratic decision making is also important, but you know, a lot of people in the early days, I was, oh, we're going to always be for consensus. Every voice must count all the time. I don't, I don't, I don't believe that anymore. I believe you use the decision-making apparatus that makes sense for what you're trying to do and who your people are. What's really important that the decision-making is based on a conversation that is where voices are cherished, basically, and that no, no single one or two voices get an outlandish amount of say. Um, it could be that there's one or two people on a particular issue that know tons and you should listen to them more than anybody else. But that in the long run, that it isn't just like one or two people are, are always the ones who are being listened to. Um, creating the conditions for that democratic dialogue, democratic decision making, and then democratic we a friend of mine, Melissa Hoover, who leads the Democracy at Work Institute was the first person who used this word for me. And maybe she coined it, maybe she didn't. It's called the duocracy. Like, who's going to actually do this shit we just decided to do? People who decide to actually do it, they get some points. I don't mean, you know, it's like, all right, are you really gonna do it? And so creating the containers where work can actually be done in ways that honor the democratic decision-making process that led to the work seems really important in an authentic democracy as well. And the doers get, a lot of say so because they're charged with getting out there and doing it. They, they, but they also need to be in a relationship of support and accountability with a wider community. And just yesterday, I was being asked by a woman who's about 30, who's thinking about her future and thinking about going to graduate school and what did I think about this and that and the other. And, and I said, whatever you decide to do, I want you to think about who are you accountable to. And by that, I do not mean who can yell gotcha if they don't like what you're doing? I'm, I mean the term accountability in the meaning of who do you give accounts to, accounts of you, what is, who do you tell your story to on a regular basis? And when, you, when they hear it from you, do they act completely disengaged and bored because it has nothing to do with them? Do they act, oh, wow, that's so cool. Keep doing more of that, please. Or do they say, what were you thinking? What a waste of time. And it's still going to be on each of us. We are all our own agents. We each have to decide what, what am I going to do, but to do it in a relationship of where you're telling your story in an accountable, that is in an accountable relationship with a body of people that, uh, that shares, you've all agreed, yeah, we share this common vision for the future. We share these values and we're going to go do our work each in our own lane maybe, but we're going to keep telling our stories to each other to get them in alignment, to say, wait, what are you, what? 
or whoa, I didn't know you could do that. I want to do that too. You know, whatever that storytelling leads to. So I guess main components are democratic dialogue and decision making, treasuring the doers, and doers should be in relationship, in an accountable relationship, by which I mean an exchanging of stories on a regular basis with people that share your values and your future vision. That's what I think authentic democracy means. Can you talk a bit about the circumstances that led you to be able to start Fund for Democratic Communities? Sure. Um, Ed and I and many of the people that we worked with doing local organizing work, I would say Ed and I in particular, we had made a point of trying to stand outside of the nonprofit industrial complex. We felt, anyway, so I had very little experience in philanthropy. It's not that I had never given my own money away or anything like that, but it just wasn't a main channel that I saw change happening through. I saw it as part of the, the established order, more or less. Meanwhile, I'm the child of rich parents. Um, not the richest parents, but rich. Rich enough to send me to a private school. Rich enough to pay for me to go to Duke without student debt. Um, and so as a young woman, whenever I would travel from North Carolina back up to Cleveland to visit my family, not whenever, but about every other year, my father would call me down to his office and I'd have a meeting with him and he would slide a piece of paper about the size of a post-it note across the table at me and, and on it would be written a seven digit number that got bigger every time. And he would say, this is what you're in line to inherit as, as of this point in time. And somewhere in my twenties, I twigged on that if that happened, I would give that money back to the communities that needed it. And I didn't have a conviction that my father had stolen the money per se or done terrible things to get it, uh, individually terrible things to get it or any, I didn't have a critique about him in my mind. It really was my understanding of how capital works, of how capitalism works, of how, how racism works, sexism, you name it, all the oppressions that I didn't need the money. I hadn't worked to earn the money. It was going back to community. And so I would tell my father, um, on these every other year conversations, dad, that's nice, but uh, you need to know if you do will this money to me, I will be giving it away. And he would get in a fight with me about it every year, every time. I didn't look forward to it, but I stuck to my guns. And um, this went on for 20 years, maybe longer, 50, 30 years, I don't know. So sometime around 2004, I think it was, I was visiting my father so in 2004, I would have been, what, um, 54 years old, something like that. Is that right? No, 50. I don't know. Um, about 50. And, um, and I was visiting my parents in Cleveland, and my dad was getting, was very ill and getting iller. He had Parkinson's, and he'd also had a bad fall, and he had torn up his knees such that he was in a wheelchair. And I was trying to, maybe by 05 that had happened. And I, he said, are you still gonna do that stupid thing with your inheritance? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I don't wanna pay death taxes on money you're just gonna give away and I want you to start a foundation. And I didn't say yes, I said, I'll think about it. And I came back to Greensboro and I called Ed and said, this is what's on offer. I think it's this much money. I think it's three or $4 million. You and I have never touched this philanthropy thing. Do you want to, I, I'm, maybe we could do it together. I don't want to do it alone. Would you do it with me? And he thought about it and called me back and said, yeah, yeah, I do want to do that with you. So, and we agreed. It was going to focus on this authentic democracy stuff that we'd been talking to each other about a lot. And then my dad died in 2007 and we had to get it going finally because my brother, who is the, um, what do you call the executor of the estate said this, you, the clock's ticking, Marnie, you only have two more months before you have to do this or that money's going back into the estate. So we, we got going on it in April of 2007. My dad died in January. And um, so that's how F40C came to be. I, prior to that, no way did Ed or I ever imagine that we would have spent the last 13, 14 years working in philanthropy and never would have crossed our minds in a million years. And as we entered into it, I think we each had an idea that this is an experiment. Let's see, we'd always done our activism with virtually no money. 
And we were like, okay, what happens if we have money on the table? What do we do that's the same? What do we do that's different? And we learned a lot of things along the way. So it's been, an, a, from the point of view, of, was it a learning experience? It sure was. I'm glad we did it. And I'm glad that that phase of the experiment is over with too. So can you give us kind of a synopsis of what exactly the Fund for Democratic Communities did for the community? Um, sure. We have F40C part one and F40C part two. And part, part one came into existence in 07 and was over by September, 2009. And that version of F40C was led by a 14 member community-based board of which Ed and I were two members. Um, and it didn't go well. And there was a kind of a, anyway, so we, if you want to ask more about that, we can talk about it, but it's just not the main point. So that board voted itself out of existence and then we redid it. And in F40C part two, um, Ed and I decided a couple of key things that were different and one was uh, that we were going to focus a lot harder on economic democracy, which has always been what Ed and I were bringing to the table in part one all the time. But we decided this is kind of where we're going to go. And by that we meant democratizing opportunities to democratizing wealth, just democratizing wealth. And, the, you know, how to do that? Is it redistribution? Is it changing the power balance so wealth accumulates differently going forward? I don't know. So democratizing wealth became a huge focus and cooperatives became a huge focus because cooperative ownership structures address this core question of who owns this shit. The, the society we have now is heavily controlled by 1% of the 1% and we live in an economic and political system that allows a very small number of people to continue to extract wealth from a large, large body of people. And we are interested in building a different political economy. Um, so that was a, a big focus. The other big decision that we made was that uh, we would sunset in 10 years. And we made that decision in 2010. It's 2020 and we did it. We closed our door. I mean, I still work for F40C. I am in the process of administratively closing it down and I will be for many more months. It's a job, it's not a fun job, but somebody's got to do it. Um, uh, but we, we did. We, in 10 years, we spent it all out. It ended up being more money than I thought it was, which I can explain later if you're curious. But by the time it was over with, I, I think the number will be 13 or $14 million will have been expended on the agenda of the Fund for Democratic Communities. The, what, so how did we translate all of what I just said, more abstract stuff, to what did we do practically? We did several things. We had a big, we were trying to revive the lost art of grassroots fundraising. And to do that, we incentivized small community-based groups to do grassroots fundraising by matching their grassroots fundraise dollars, dollar for dollar. Because what had happened because of the nonprofit industrial complex, basically grants were flowing to groups that already had grants. And you, if anything, they were matching other grant makers money instead of the little people's money. And it was our contention that if your group is doing something that your community really wants and needs, they'll, they'll cough up $5 for the spaghetti dinner or $10 to buy a t-shirt or whatever it is that you're doing to raise your money. You need, that's like a stamp of approval you're getting from the community. And it's also base building behavior. Once somebody's given you five or $10, they, you owe them something. You, they're, they're a stakeholder with you. So it's a way of broadening the base of support for grassroots groups. So we had throughout the entire course of F40C part two, we did this grassroots fundraising matching grants program. And eventually we'll get around to listing all the grantees. If you go to our website, you can see a year to year list of who our grantees are. And the vast majority of the groups listed there are, are groups that receive matching grants for that grassroots fundraising. To do that, we had to teach groups how to do grassroots fundraising. Um, and so, I mean, we, were, we, we definitely had a stake in, in that skill set becoming more commonplace. Then in the, in the, and we gave money in that to groups that did anything in any way connected to authentic democracy. It didn't have to be in this economic democracy vein. But we were also focusing on the economic democracy vein. And I would say cooperative economic development became a huge focus. Um, and then another sort of sub-focus that came to be as big as that was 
uh, non-extractive finance for the cooperative economy. So over the last five years of F40C, when I thought about what's Marnie's job every day when she goes to work, I thought I work in three areas and they are one is nested within the other within the other. So the most local level was the local work we were doing on the Renaissance Community Co-op Grocery Store, which was needed, a grocery store was needed by the community, it was owned by the community, um, and helping that store come into existence, and then once it was alive, trying to help it succeed became a really core thing for that community, but also as an existence proof of community ownership works to meet real community needs. And that didn't work, ultimately. In, in January 2019, RCC closed its doors. And there's writing that we've done about that that's available uh, on our web. Actually, I don't know if it is on our website, but it's available on, on Nonprofit Quarterly's website uh, about all the lessons we learned about what went right and what went wrong there. Um, some of the lending that came to the RCC was through that non to, to make it possible to open the store came through that non extractive finance model through the Southern Reparations Loan Fund. And that so that was another thing I did for my job. I was part of the support system for the Southern Reparations Loan Fund. And then the Southern Reparations Loan Fund needed a national support system about non-extractive finance. And it, it was only a couple of years ago that that, I, I mean, as far back as 2012, we were in conversation with people doing non-extractive finance type things all over the country. And eventually it gelled into something called Seed Commons but it wasn't called that for the longest time. It was called the financial cooperative amongst us and we didn't even know what to call it. But what it is is a national cooperative of revolving loan funds that are all working this same program of non-extractive finance, trying to bring finance capital under the control of grassroots community folks and having a huge component of local control, but the capital raising part of it and the back end infrastructure gets handled at a national level so that these local loan funds can get to work, make putting that capital to work on cool projects that meet community needs and build community ownership. Um, so we did a lot of that. We did it by making grants, but F40C was also a, an operating foundation. It's a special tax classification. So we were a private foundation every year of life. Most years we also met the criteria to be a private operating foundation. And that just means we had a program. So we didn't just spend money out on other nonprofits. We were spending money on program that we ran. And so the development of the Southern Reparations Loan Fund, for example, was a program we ran ourselves. Eventually we spun it off and it stands up on its own two feet now, only by virtue of the fact that it gets all the support it needs from Seed Commons, which is another part of the program that we didn't invent Seed Commons on our own by a mile, but we were a key party in the development of Seed Commons, and it now will move forward without any help from F4DC as well. And I wanna say locally, um, there were a couple other things where I think we really made a difference and it was done through grants mostly, and also just listening to people and being a, a, a sounding board for local organizers. And one has to do with, we've got a many years track record working in the undocumented immigrant community of Greensboro, and we are very proud that we have funded the formation of Siembra NC, what is now Siembra NC, and various, various instantiations of organizing the organized undocumented immigrants to take the lead on their own path. And Siembra NC is that, and we were part of that. And the other big thing that we did locally, and both of these are at the local and state level, um, is we are behind, we are big time behind the formation of, we, you know, it's funny, Ed and I did a ton of work on Guilford County schools and felt like, it felt like we had a teaspoon trying to use a teaspoon to turn an oil tanker. And that's largely because of the way schools are funded, being, you know, not local, it's the state, and then there's a local component and then the feds, but a lot of the rules about schools are at the fed and state level, not local. And we just couldn't, and the culture of schools is so deeply embedded. I mean, it just felt super frustrating. So we kind of walked away from that, but we did notice like around 2012, we were talking with education activists who were interested in forming powerful teacher unions that understood that 
the teacher union was not just for teachers getting better pay and benefits, that it was about building the kind of schools that would serve all students. And that grew into something called Organize 2020. And back in 2012, 2013, when that term started being thrown around, what that meant was, we're gonna to organize to take over NCAE by 2020. And they did. And they, I mean, they've been making steady headway on it. And it was not an easy thing. It meant building up strong local chapters in all the, you know, in many, many counties of North Carolina. And they've been taking on more and more of the seats of the executive council of the NCAE. And in April, they took, they basically took over with huge number. I mean, almost every seat on that executive is now held by an organized 2020 member from somewhere around the state. And the new president and vice president of NCAE are driving a progressive vision that is not one they thought up, but one a huge mass of teachers working with families thought up over the last several years. And the role of NCAE and the role of Guilford County Association of Educators right now couldn't be more important because how are we going to have school that's safe for everybody and effective for everybody under these extreme COVID conditions? And the simplistic answers of make them go back to school isn't doing that. And I, the place the real organizing and thinking is happening as far for my dollars is in NCAE and in the and in the local chapters like GCAE. So F40C has been a sounding board and provided funding that helped organize 2020 do that job of gaining the ascendancy and building the vision and attracting thousands of teachers to that vision. And that's what they're working with now. I have to say this morning I was on a call with somebody local wanting to understand more about what FRDC had done. And I said, not as much as we wanted. It's, it's funny because in retrospect, FRDC has a bigger name in the funder world outside of Greensboro and in the economic justice world outside of Greensboro than it ever has. And not that we didn't try in Greensboro, but we ended up ultimately choosing RCC as the, as the major place we were gonna try to drive that agenda and it didn't work, so. Um, why would you say it didn't work? I, mean, sure it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, the tons, it is really important that we, when that store closed, we took it on as a failure and as our failure. And we, it is really important to get people to think about failure differently than the way we do in general in our culture, because I mean, we're in big, as the world is in terrible shape. So if we keep doing what we've been doing in general, in our society, we're screwed. And so we need to make major changes. And we can argue about what are those changes, but it's really clear to me that we can't keep doing small incremental things and hoping it's gonna get to make a, take effect in time. We got seven, eight years on the climate change do or die thing. And we've got, we've clearly crossed some kind of line on the, social injustice scale with, with George Floyd's murder and the reaction to that. So there's so many destabilizing things that's, that are happening that it's creating the opportunity, but it's also the case that even if those destabilizing things hadn't happened right now, the clock is ticking. So you wanna make big change, you gotta experiment to try new things. And if you're gonna experiment, you're gonna fail about as often as you're gonna succeed, maybe even more often. Fear of failure stops you from experimenting. And so you have to be able to understand failure is inevitable in many things. You, if you knew the X was gonna fail, don't do X. But if you don't know what's gonna succeed and what's gonna fail, you need to start trying X, Y, Z and, and onward. And, and so the failure of the RCC is something that we sort of, I might say I'm proud of it, but I am proud of the way we reacted to it by talking about it as a failure and, and trying to understand why did it fail and promulgating all the lessons we learned from it. And, um, and we're somewhat unique in that respect. Most foundations and most co-op developers do not talk about the businesses that failed and the projects that failed. We talk about it all over the place. And we are, we want, it was funny, RCC won an award the year it opened for being like the co-op of the year from the co-op movement, the food co-op movement. And then we won co-op of the year 
in a slightly different category the year we closed for having been truthful about what the hell happened. Um, and the, the theory being, if we talk about everything we couldn't figure out, then the people in other communities that are facing food desert problems have a big leg up about, look, we figured this stuff out. Don't waste your time figuring it out. We know how to do that. This is what you need to focus on because if you don't figure it out, you're going to fail too. So anyway, we gave all the clues that we could and it's all very well documented in webinars and in this 20 page article that we wrote and so on and so forth. So I'm going to ask a horrible question. Can you get a broad overview of what you learned, even though you've written 20 page articles? Yeah, about yeah. I'm going to see if I can regurgitate it. Hold on. It's the two C's and the three M's. Corporate, the first C, corporate competition, it's not, it's worse than you think, and it's not what you think. In our case, what we didn't understand, we had, we had done a, um, a market analysis and feasibility study that showed we, we should have no problem getting 5% of the market share looking at the current competition in the two mile radius. They did not take into account the dollar stores. And during the period that we were raising money and building the plan, the dollar stores invaded East Greensboro as they have invaded every low income part of the country. And that is taking a huge proportion of uh, poor people's food dollars right now. And it's, a, I mean, it's just a machine. And the, so that corporate competition is huge. The second C is capacity. And by that, I mean the capacity of like, do people know how to run a store? And do enough people know how to run a store? Is there enough time given the resources you have to build a staff? Do you have enough staff time to do all the things that you need to do to be successful? Within that capacity compartment, we put three M's, and let me remember them. Management. Oh, I, I should know these off by heart, but I don't, sorry. It's been a year since I wrote that paper, so I'm, I'm losing it. But one of the M's that wasn't in the list was money. Because F4DC had deep pockets, that store kept having money. They had a long runway to figure it out, much longer than many operations will because we kept thinking, we need more runway, we'll figure it out, we'll figure it out. And I'm not sorry that we extended the runway as long as we did, because we did figure out a few things along the way, and it also kept people employed. So money was not one of the three M's. The, the third M was mobilization. And I think we confounded, so to get the store built, we did a great job of actual base building and building of a power base. And, but once the store opened, we didn't have staffing that was focused on keeping those folks caring a lot about the store. So just because somebody had bought a membership at the store didn't mean they shopped at the store. And anyways, so, oh, the third, the middle M is marketing, of course. We believed, we drank our own Kool-Aid. We thought if we build it, they will come. The neighborhood's been crying for a grocery store for 18 years. And we, sure, we had a marketing plan and all that stuff, but actually breaking into that market was really, really hard. And the presumption that just because we were an ethical business that was clean and brightly lit and cheerful to be in and paid its employees a little bit better than the other grocery stores, people didn't change their shopping habits just because we thought this was the best thing in the world. So it was um, management, we had weak management, we had weak marketing, or we didn't figure the marketing thing out and we confused mobilization with, with movement building. That's the third and movement building. We, we had built a movement to build the store, but we didn't continue to act like movement builders. We acted like a store. And maybe we could have compensated for our problems on the marketing side if we had continued to emphasize movement building. So those are the, the two C's and the three M's that we learned about the RCC. All right. So uh, turning things a little bit, the Fund for Democratic uh, Communities was also involved with the Occupy movement. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, authentic, there you have it, some authentic democracy and obsessively focused with economic fairness, right? Of course we were there. <laughs> um, yeah. And you know, just this morning, I had reason to recall the lovely role that the YWCA of Greensboro played they at that time owned their longstanding headquarters, their building was downtown near where the public, the central library is. It was like the back side of the library. They were there. That building's no longer there. They ended up selling that building and 
after a sojourn up on Spring Garden Street, moved to the where they are now on East Wendover Avenue. But at that time, they still owned that building. They weren't occupying. It couldn't even be occupied anymore because of maintenance issues. And they were in the process of selling it. But we reached out to uh, Lindy Garnett, who was the ED at the YWCA. We didn't know her. I remember actually getting dressed up to go meet her, like wearing nice clothes, which I don't do most days, thinking, oh, she's like the other EDs I've known in the YWCA land. I got to wear a dress. <laughs> I couldn't have been more wrong. And we get in there and we're saying, look, we're Occupy is about to occupy the city park that is immediately adjacent to your place. And if the cops come down, we need a place to retreat. Can we retreat to the YW? She said, oh, hell yeah, I'm down with that. And her being a participant in this got us conversations with the police that we needed to have on a completely different tenor. And we did sometimes have to retreat to the YWCA property to get away from the cops. And <laughs> anyway, I love Lindy and I love the YWCA. One of the many ways they understand the principle of solidarity and mutual aid was exemplified back in 2011. Yeah, so a lot of that movement nationally and locally was driven by the, the housing foreclosure crisis. And so, you know, in the initial weeks of Occupy, it was about can we maintain a space where people just stop going to work and they instead are talking about how are we gonna survive this horrible economy and what can we do with each other politically, what can we do with each other and by way of mutual aid, all that kind of stuff. And that was happening in that park next to this, the old YWCA building for weeks and weeks. So part of our process there was meeting all kinds of new people that were cool, that ended up being friends of ours for the next 10 years. Um, and part of it was remaking friends with folks we hadn't seen in a long time who came out for the Occupy movement. But the, for me, the major chunk of work that came out of that was this this obsession with the, what did the foreclosure crisis look like in Greensboro, North Carolina, and what were we gonna do about it? So we set up a crew called the Mortgage Fraud Detectives that were trained by an attorney out of Durham, whose name escapes me right now, about what's involved legally in a foreclosure crisis. And because one of the dirty underpinnings of that foreclosure crisis was that when people were buying their houses, the paper, the loans that they had taken out were sold and then sold again and sold again. It was, and so the, the body that might be foreclosing on a homeowner, the homeowner might know, not even know they were in the chain at all. And a lot of irregular and illegal things happened as that paper was sold along the way. And so helping foreclosed homeowners in particular, like individual cases, figure out really does that group have the right to foreclose on me and helping them fight to stay in their houses was one body of work that we did and then another body of work was researching how widespread fraud was in the low in the Guilford County foreclosure filings and so we had this whole team of people being trained on how to in fact oh I need to find it where is it do I have a button to tell you oh shoot I'm a mortgage fraud detective. I have these big buttons that said, I'm a mortgage fraud detective with like a Sherlock Holmesy kind of thing on it that all of our volunteers wore whenever they went down to the um, courthouse to do the research. And I mean, I just, when I was getting the archives ready, I think you guys inherited some of those boxes of paperwork on in just data on every foreclosure filing that we came across. We decided to focus on one year only and what happened was we came to understand there's a lot of fraud, but we didn't have the analysis capacity to go through. I mean, we compiled this incredible amount of information. And I, towards the end, I'm like, who's interested in this? Can't some graduate program someplace take this off our hands and go to town with this? Can't some law school clinic intervene with a class action suit? And so I met a lot of wonderful people. We did great work. We, we ended up making a movie or supporting another group that was closely allied with us to make a movie called um, Let's Lose Our House. It was like a 20 minute film that had its premiere at the Carolina Theater and the Rachel Maddow show came and featured our premiere one night on their <laughs> news. Um, and that movie was a homemade movie that explained how the banks you know, the Glass-Steagall, Ed played the part of Glass-Steagall if I'm remembering correctly. <laughs> this movie. Um, anyway, 
So yes, lots of work about mortgage fraud. And I, another example of not quite failure, but we sure didn't close the loop on that one. I'm not, so, again, I'm not sorry. Um, I've met a lot of cool people and, and activated some cool people. And I'm, I mean, a, about a month ago, two months ago, I got a call from a woman that I worked very closely with in that project. Um, a woman whose own house was foreclosed. And then we became, I mean, we were already friends, but we really became friends after that. But I hadn't seen her in a long time. And she called me to clue me in that she'd been watching some live feed video of um, one of the uh, Black Lives Matter protests and had figured out that some of the Proud Boys were on the scene. And she didn't know who to call. Like, there's Proud Boys about to wreak mayhem on these pro innocent protesters. She called me to tell me about it. And I'm like, I'm doing my best to figure out, okay, what do I do with that information? But that's an example of the kind of relationships that are in place because of that kind of work. Were you involved with the Black Lives Matter movement in Greensboro? Um, not to, not very much. I think a few times we've made grants to Black Lives. I, certainly we made grants and built connections with folks in Ferguson, which is really the origin story of the terminology. Um, and have, we've had a, a, Black Lives Matter matters a lot. I think it's, the, the phraseology is important and the principle is important. And it, it's an, one of the first movements. It's kind of like um, Me Too. It's a hashtag movement. And the question about all hashtags movements is can they trade the mobile, easy mobilization that comes from being a hashtag movement to doing the community building and movement building that means you can actually build power and, and go for the long haul. And I think they're making that turn. I think that is evident now. It was what, it was the spontaneous uprisings after George Floyd's mu murder that kind of instigated the, a, a greater emphasis on movement building, even as all this mobilization was also happening. By the way, it is Jane McAlevey, who's a union organizer par excellence, who was the person I learned this distinction between mobilizing and movement building from. Um, so yeah, we've been tied up with various instantiations of Black Lives Matter. We bring a Black Lives Matter perspective into the funding world when we're at the funder tables. Um, although I can't say that we've made, moved much money to any explicitly Black Lives Matter organization. It's sort of just built into our DNA to talk about it. I would say we're also, Ed and I are, I don't even know how to get into this. Our, our feel, I believe in racism. Like, I don't believe in it like I support it. I am inalterably opposed to it. I believe it exists and is a terrible problem and must be eradicated. I do not believe that race as a construct has much meaning, if any, at all. And one of the, one of the things to, we need to disentangle our obsessions with race from our work against racism. And so when F4DC has been on the scene in matters of racial justice, we are always talking about, we are always trying to do that disentangling because we don't believe in essentializing any race. And there's, there's, a, there's a thing we're fighting against, frankly, which is a new essentialism that features all the great qualities of black and brown people and demonizes white people because they are white. It is, it's, the, it's the exact flip. Now, where does power lie right now? It lies in, in general with white people and, and we're in a struggle to distribute that power to all people. And in the course of that, black and brown people are gonna gain a lot of power if we are successful. The, the, this, the thing I'm talking about here, about this re-essentializing, we have to fight against it because otherwise we're gonna build a society that always has to be hierarchical. We're working towards a society that doesn't, that can conceive of doing things together without racial hierarchies, without class hierarchies, without sex and gender hierarchies. We're trying to get past hierarchy, period. Um, so. You, uh, the organization was also involved with 
um, advocating for participatory budgeting in Greenwich? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we really spent a lot of time, staff time particularly, a little bit of grant resource, but a lot of staff time on that from 2011 until, hmm, I don't know, 2015, 2016, something like that. Maybe even, and, and actually we kept our hand in until only a, a year or two ago. Um, we had to high, I mean, this had, we are materialists. We, where is the money tells you a lot about where is the power and the control of the public purse is a, a great venue that, to figure out how to learn about democracy and democratic decision-making and all that. So yeah, we saw participatory budgeting as having a whole lot of promise as a way to, to build authentic democracy about something that really matters a whole lot. And we originally began working with the Participatory Budgeting Project, which is a national group based mostly in New York. Um, and they taught us a lot about PB. They, they were connected to the first PB project in the US, which was in Chicago. They also were growing their own New York City PB project. And um, they were excited to be doing a Southern PB project. And so we had it in our mind that we were gonna get originally $2 million of the, of the as our, and this was just our starting point. We, eventually we thought the entire city budget of the city of Greensboro was gonna be set through participatory processes. Because we bet it, we bet that if if that happened, there would be less money for policing and more money for basketball, for midnight basketball and libraries being open later, and all kinds of things would shift around to a different quality of life and fairer stuff for everybody. But our opening bid was two million dollars of the uh, operating budget of the city of Greensboro, which I think is um, I don't know, I, half of one percent or something like that. Well, where it's at now, thanks to our early work and then the work that others carried out afterwards is that about $500,000 of a capital budget gets spent every other year through a participatory process. And I'm not happy about, I mean, sure, I'm glad that happened. Before that, the city would, its annual budgeting process involved each council member holding one meeting in their district after the budget had basically been set to say, this is where we're heading. What do you guys think? And seven people per district would show up and say whatever they said. And they would know, there were no new ideas being considered then. It was like, oh, are these proportions quite right? And it didn't even matter what the seven people said, really. And that was their public input. And now that they don't do that anymore because the PB process is expected to stand in instead. And there are now hundreds of people, if not a thousand people a year, each year that it happens every other year voting or in some way coming up with ideas. And that's cool, I like that. But it's a corner of the budget. It's a capital only, which means you're really not getting at the serious business of really, we're gonna keep investing in our police and we're not gonna invest in the library and police get even more and you know, that, that kind of stuff. And, and it's a capital expenditure that can be made in one year. So anything that required ongoing maintenance or support ruled out, it was just like, it really kind of tokenized the whole thing. And it's something to build from at this point in time. Another learning experience for us. <laughs> so of all the projects you worked on with the organization, which one are you most proud of? Oh, I think it's the nested nexus of RCC, Southern Reparations Loan Fund and Seed Commons. And of those three things, as Southern Reparations Loan Fund and Seed Commons are alive and well, really alive, really well. And I'm totally psyched about that. And the lessons learned from the RCC informed, that's how I knew that we needed to build a non-extractive finance because we knew we needed it for this grocery store. So that's the body of work that makes me the happiest, I think. Um, is there anything that we didn't cover in the interview that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, um, I don't know that it's as, like, it's not the thing that makes me the happiest, but it is where I've spent a fair amount of time and Ed did too. And that has to do with funder organizing and the whole concept of philanthropy and what do we think about it and all that. Um, it took years for us to start finding other philanthropy people that thought along the lines we did. And until that happened, he and I would go to conferences and just like, oh my God, what are we doing here? I feel so lonely. But we found those people in a few uh, funder formations, mostly at the national level. Um, and we've been making common cause with them and we continue to. 
And we've helped, I believe we contributed to some smarter thinking about what is the role of philanthropy and some understanding about the limits of philanthropy as a tool. Because once you're up inside of it, it looks like that's the lever. We just got to keep pulling that lever and we get more money in that lever and it's good. But the, but the problem with the philanthropic thing we have right now is that it's based on big piles of money that were accrued through extractive practices of capitalism and racism and all that. And we're working towards a future where that could never happen again. So what is the role in this transition? If we're, I, we, I have to get up every day and think, I'm in a transitional period. We're leaving that phase and we're going to this new, more democratic, just and sustainable economy that we're all working towards. And so what is the role of these big piles of money that are held by foundations in this transitional time? My basic take on it is move it out as fast as you can. And how fast can you move it and move it well? Depends on the quality and the number of relationships that you have. It depends on your understanding about where the money can make the most difference. And so in 2010, when Ed and I decided to sunset within 10 years, we, <laughs> I just so naive. Okay, well, it'll take us a year or two to gear up, but then whatever's left, we just split it evenly between those next eight years. That is not what happened. It took us five or six years to build the relationships and start the partnerships with groups, that, the groups that became Seed Commons, the groups that became the Southern Reparations Loan Fund, the, to be able to have the channels to focus that money in useful ways that we're actually building this new world that we're working towards. If we had just accepted what was already out there, we wouldn't have built, been as transformative as I believe that we are. The transformation is just beginning. We haven't changed the world that much, but we have helped instigate something that could change the world a whole lot. So in our, in our conversations with like-minded philanthropists, a lot of what they're talking about these days is, okay, we can see that it's kind of weird that we're the ones who get to decide about this big pile of money. So do we just democratize the table at this philanthropy, bringing more people in to sit beside us and maybe outnumber us? Or do we move the money out to already democratized tables that have been built, purpose built by the grassroots groups that need this money and, can, and know what to do with it? And I would say that Ed and I were busy building democratized tables a whole lot of the time at F4DC. We built the Seed Commons table along with others. We were part of building the Southern Reparations Loan Fund table, and then we moved the money to those tables. So I'm basically a fan of move, find the authentic democracy that's out there and move the money there. Not invite all these grassroots people to spend time on your philanthropic project. However, sometimes you, that's all you can do with certain philanthropy. You know, sometimes the program staff of a, of a foundation are way further ahead than the family trustees. If, they, if that's how they can move the money, then invite people in and get them to move the money that way. That's just an example of the sort of world that Ed and I started to inhabit, which we couldn't have before we had been at F40C for a while. And it was part of the experiment. Can we affect other philanthropies? And we definitely have. I, I could name several. And one of the things that I take comfort from is that some of those other philanthropies are busy doing the stuff that we would have been doing if we weren't out of money at this point. I would name the Cypress Foundation, which just formed a year or so ago in North Carolina. They do work in North Carolina and South Carolina. It's one, the Libra Foundation, the Catali Foundation. Uh, well, the Chorus Foundation, I'm not sure they did it because we, the, talked them into it, but they are just like this. We love those guys and they're doing many of the same things. Um, yeah, so we found com people to make common cause with. And if, we, if, if we're successful, there will be no more philanthropy as we know it in 10 or 20 years. We'll see. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Hmm. I'm, I'm, my father popped into my mind. Um, let me... Let me find this. So that is me and my dad when I was in my late 20s, maybe, in a train station in Winter Park, Florida. I'd taken the train down there with Catherine to visit him for a week or so. Um, and he did not understand. 
I mean, that he, he, he knew I was going to do something weird with this money. And he probably didn't, wouldn't like 90% of what we're doing. <laughs> and yet I feel very connected to him on a regular basis. And it's just, I don't even know what to do with that. I will just say he's on my mind a lot as I'm shutting it down. And he was on my mind a lot as I was starting it up. And he did do one thing that was really life affirming for me, which is the portion of what I would have inherited that wasn't taxed because it went to a foundation. He took that savings from not having to pay the taxes and he added it to my, to F4DC's portion, which means in, in a weird way, I got more than my brothers and my sister. I, I didn't personally get it. F4DC got it. And I, whether he intended me to take this meaning from it or not, I take that as an endorsement of what I'm doing. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's so interesting. I'm a very political person. I politicize everything. I'm all about economics and spreadsheets and things like that. And yet I, this guy who's not about my politics and he wouldn't use spreadsheet, he might use a spreadsheet, but not to do what I'm doing in it. And I don't know, I'm just feeling really, really close to him right now, so. Well, thank you for, for sharing that very personal feeling. Yeah. Um, I think it sounds like your father appreciated you sticking to your platform and living authentically. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> we might have fought about it every time I was with him, but he, I did stick with it, yeah. So. Well, thank, thank you very much for speaking with me today. It was great, Stacy. I really enjoyed doing this. So um, let me know what I can do to facilitate any